Would you please pray with me? O Holy One, come to us, speak to us, touch us, and stir us through your word and through the words that you place on each of our hearts. And O oh dear God, may the words that I have to offer here this morning please you and honor you and glorify your holy name. In Jesus' sweet name we pray. Amen. Amen. I'd like to begin this morning with a brief exercise. It's, it's not a quiz. Consider it more of a spiritual exercise, if you will. I'm going to share some historic questions that have been asked of all of us over time and see if you can remember who first spoke these words. Here's the first one. Life's most persistent and urgent question is, what are you doing for others? Any guesses? The Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King, Jr. Here's the next one. God will not ask how many good things have you done in your life. Rather, God will ask, how much love did you put into what you did? Who does that sound like? Mother Teresa. This next question is from a poem. What happens to a dream deferred? It is in the first line of the poem Harlem, written by Langston Hughes. The next one is a short question. And ain't I a woman? These are words of sojourner truth. And this last one is not actually a question, but it is a statement about a question. And so, my fellow Americans, ask not what your country can do for you, but ask what you can do for your country. Of course, that is President John F. Kennedy. Questions. Profound and intentional questions such as these often have the capacity to engage us on a deep, deep level and maybe even have the power to change our thinking and our behavior and maybe even our hearts. However, I do know from a whole lot of personal experience that it is so easy to miss the deeper meaning of the questions that have been asked because many of us, I believe, have that tendency to jump right into a problem-solving mode and focused on finding solutions to the questions. During these past couple of weeks, as I have been wrestling with our gospel reading from John for today, I realized for the first time how easy it is to completely miss or dismiss the question that Jesus poses to his disciple Philip in this familiar story. In verse 5, Jesus asks him, Where are we to buy bread for these people to eat? Where are we to buy bread for these people to eat? But I suppose that it is easy to miss that question. Because in this pericope, as Mark pointed out earlier, there's not just one, but two miracle stories. Jesus feeds the 5,000 and he walks on water, all in the same story. And, and another thing to keep in mind is that now that our lectionary has shifted gears from Mark to John, is that the writing style of John is significantly different from that of Mark. As you may recall, the, 
Gospel writer of Mark is direct and concise and even abrupt. The Gospel writer of John, on the other hand, perhaps written about 30 years or so after Mark, is noted for its deep and philosophical and even mystical style of writing. As an aside, I learned in seminary that you just got to spend some time with John in order for the deeper meaning of the text to finally emerge. So back to Jesus' question to Philip. Where are we to buy bread for these people to eat? Now, why would Jesus ask Philip that question? I mean, after all, Jesus is the all-knowing and all-powerful heal miracle healer and worker. He already knows the answer to his own question, right? Well, the Gospel writer of John certainly addresses any confusion that we may have in the next statement. He writes, Jesus said this to test him, for he himself knew what he was going to do. Some other translations word this phrase a bit differently, using the language, Jesus said this to try him. And the message paraphrase puts it this way, Jesus said this to stretch Philip's faith. No matter what specific language is used, the Gospel writer of John is intentional in describing Jesus' ability to pose a powerful question, a question that fully engages his followers as active participants in his ministry. And in this case, it was the ministry and the miracle of feeding 5,000. It was after Jesus questioned Philip for all of the disciples to hear that Andrew then responded. Andrew looked around. He did an inventory, so to speak, and he was able to identify some of the needed resources that were already right there in their midst. Andrew immediately reported back to Jesus and said, there is a boy here who has five barley loaves and two fish. And then Jesus took it from there. He blessed the loaves and the fish, and to the amazement of the crowds, there was more than enough to feed the multitudes, so much so that there were even leftovers. This well-known story, this miracle story, is also a shared ministry story in that it engaged the followers of Jesus in the work of feeding those who are hungry. Now, I realize that we all have many different names or titles that we ascribe to Jesus, different ways we describe him, such as Miracle worker, healer, leader, rabbi, teacher, friend. But hearing our text again at this time reminds me that Jesus was also a community organizer. Jesus knew how to engage those among him in order to address and meet the unmet needs of the people in their midst. Jesus knew how to inspire others that they would become active participants in his ministry by taking responsibility for assessing the needs of the community as well as the available resources at hand. And in this story, it all started with a question. When Jesus asked, where are we to buy bread for these people to eat? 
In this one question, Jesus pushed the limits of his disciples' understanding. He challenged their feelings of resignation in response to overwhelming circumstances and what appeared to be a hopeless situation. And in this same question, Jesus also extended an invitation and an opportunity to engage and participate in his ministry with and among and for the people. When and where in your life have you found yourself responding or organizing around a question that has been lifted? Perhaps you can think of a time here within the life of the congregation at First Church. Maybe there was a time when the needs of some of our members and friends were made known to you. Or maybe you were the one to first ask that question that then inspired others to step forward in order to brainstorm together, to put a plan in place and create a new opportunity for shared ministry. That is the power of the Holy Spirit moving in and through and among the people of God in order to do the work of the church together. And that, my friends, is nothing short of a miracle. I'd like to close this morning with a favorite quote, some encouraging words that speak to the experience of holding the not yet answered questions of our lives. These are words of Rainer Maria Rilke. He wrote these words almost a hundred years ago in the book Letters to a Young Poet. Try to love the questions themselves as if they were locked rooms or books written in a very foreign language. Don't search for the answers which could not be given to you now because you would not be able to live with them. And the point is to live everything. Live the questions now. Thanks be to God. Amen.